far on my grand tour of Europe, I've visited Paris, Venice and Rome, meeting the sometimes cranky and always horny English tourists who flocked to these cities in the 18th century. But in this episode, I've reached my final destination and it's time for my grand tour to come to its explosive end. Verdi Napoli e poi muori. See Naples and die. In the 18th century, perhaps quite literally, we all know the story of Pompeii, Roman city buried under ash in 79 CE when Mount Vesuvius erupted. But did you know that although Mount Vesuvius is largely dormant today, throughout the 18th century it was actively erupting all the time. In the Grand Tour era, the city of Naples held a dangerous fascination for British tourists, not only because of the threat of destruction by this temperamental volcano, but also because it was during the 18th century that the first large-scale excavations of Pompeii and Herculaneum were taking place. The Brits were obsessed. They wrote books, made paintings, and even wrote poetry about the drama of Vesuvius. And they travelled to Naples in droves to catch a bit of that danger for themselves. Naples at the time was the largest city on the Italian peninsula, with a population of 400,000 people, and it became a favourite stop for grand tourists because there was supposedly less pressure on tourists to see all the sites like they did in Rome. What's more, the Roman excavations and artefacts that they were digging up painted a very different and sometimes shocking image of the ancient world than those on display in Rome. In Rome, the Forum and the Colosseum told a majestic story of democracy and civilization, but in Pompeii and Herculaneum, the two main archaeological sites of Naples, the discoveries were far more mundane and, at times, rather saucy. At Pompeii, they were discovering erotic fresco paintings and brothels, which shocked and concerned the English Protestants, along with many other everyday items that show that the Romans were perhaps not all geniuses and gods, but just normal, everyday people like us. How shocking. The reason this was so confronting to the English tourists was because of the great mythology around Rome as the pinnacle of civilization, a civilization that Western Europeans believed they inherited. To be the cultural descendants of ancient Rome was to be rational, intelligent, and culturally refined. Notions that were very popular in the 18th and 19th centuries at a time when Europe was actively colonizing other parts of the world. You see, in order to justify the subjugation of another people and culture, you have to really believe that your culture is superior. The uneasy truth that lies beneath the story of the Grand Tour is that this travel tradition was not only about the education of the privileged individual who took part in it, but also about the making of the mythology of Western civilization. I finally reached the end of my grand tour. On this journey, I've walked in the footsteps of the typical 18th century English gentleman and discovered that there was pretty much no place above his criticism. I saw the ugliest, beastliest town in the universe survive wolf attacks and frostbite, admired the worst architecture I ever yet saw, and complained about all those other tourists getting in the way. Despite being whinging, often pompous posh boys, I still think we owe a small debt to the grand tourists of the 18th century for paving the way for modern day tourism. Today, of course, travel is safer, easier, and more accessible than it has ever been. And although we don't see visiting France and Italy as being that adventurous anymore, the cities of the Grand Tour are still some of the most popular tourist destinations in the world. Not only that, but the idea that travel widens your worldview and helps you grow as a young person certainly endures today in the form of the gap year. I'm now enjoying my last bit of sunshine before I head back home. And in the true Grand Tour spirit, I'm feeling worldly, educated, and above all, ready for a proper cup of tea.